We've patrolled the perimeter again, Lord Colme. Nothing to report. <laughs> 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 Tank style. Come on, come on. Welcome to our first episode of Text of the Matter. I am Egon Sheely. I am Misha. Welcome, welcome. We got Ashwin on the uh, the faders and the knobs. Here at RCM Studios in Chicago, Illinois. So we are a podcast that deals with philosophical texts. Unlike most podcasts, we uh, are not trying to condense somebody's life work into 15-minute segments. Uh, we're actually here trying to look at philosophical text uh, in a manner in which it is faithful, faithful to them and uh, is honorable to the actual ideas contained therein. And I think furthermore, uh, one of the principal concerns of this podcast is to make readable, make accessible uh, the texts of the past that are... Um, extremely prevalent in the language of the left and of philosophical th thought of uh, the present um, and offer that to the public. Um, oftentimes these are treated as, you know, completely opaque texts that uh, uh, are absolutely unreadable, but... Um, pedantic, yeah. uh, dense, all of these things. And so what we're trying to do is take those texts and try and give them uh, not only the respect they deserve, but uh, try and bring them into the modern day in a way that's a little bit more easily accessible. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, and since this is our first episode, I think we're going to take just a few minutes right now uh, to kind of explain ourselves a little bit. Um, you know, you might be thinking, like, why are we doing this? Why look at a 900-page book that is, you know, about 300 years old? What it Like, what is the worth in that? What is the value in that? Um, why would you bother doing that? But by asking those questions, you are already actually engaging in a kind of metaphysics and so this is our approach. You know, if, if you're curious as to why we might do something like this, those exact questions are the reasons that someone engages in philosophy, that someone is interested in metaphysics. Um, we are interested in why the world works as it does, how we can uh, control that world, in what ways can we, uh, you know, as you were saying, Misha, um, Particularly on the left, we use these ideas to try and shape our world. So if we have a better understanding of how these ideas are working, where they're coming from, we're going to be better at building a future that we all want to see uh, and not one that Mitch McConnell gets to live in. And over <laughs> the extension of our project... Our hope is that we can elaborate a series of ideas that shows their transformation in time and shows the potential transformation of ideas in the future. Um, and that's something that I believe we'll be able to get into today right here with Kant, however, you know, uh, stuffy he is presented as, because he was. He was. He, he was. He truly was. I once heard this book that we're uh, doing today, Critique of Pure Reason, described as written like a legal brief, which it is, which is to say it's very long. It has a lot of words that are hard to make sense of, and he repeats himself all the time. <laughs> Repetition. <laughs> Repetition. Uh, so do you want to just dive right in there, Misha? Let's do it. Let's do it. Um, so Critique of Pure Reason was published twice, not once, but twice, because uh, he was such a stickler for getting it right and being understood that he published two editions, one in 1781, the other one in 1787. Um, but basically, he set out um, 
basically to take care of a, a feud that was going on at this time. Um, you had, this was kind of the height of rationalism versus empiricism as far as uh, the philosophical world is concerned. Uh, and he set out to kind of make things right and uh, wanted to give a foundation and a basis, uh, an ep- epistemological foundation to philosophy going forward. Yes, and, and, and this wasn't just a philosophical divide. Um, through the Enlightenment, which is one of his primary concerns and he w- and a subject on which he wrote a book, um, it was a geographical concern as well. Um, The empirical school was a British school um, through and through, while the rest of continental Europe followed rationalism. And rationalism you can describe as Descartes, Leibniz, and Spinoza, but you can also look to the philosophes like Rousseau and others as being representatives of these ideas. And so this conflict, this antinomy, um, was something that Kant saw as specifically obfuscating, uh, and that's the word I was looking for earlier to describe <laughs> this book, Ka-ching. but um, <laughs> um, was obfuscating the philosophical debate. Right. And uh, he does an incredible job at, at div- uh, crossing that line. Yeah, and I should say, before we get the uh, cart ahead of the horse here, some of you out there might even be like, whoa, 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 hold on, hold on rationalism, empiricism, what in the world are you talking about? Yes. Um, Basically, what we're talking about is this idea that, uh, particularly in the Enlightenment, there was a school of folks who believed that you could only prove truth through experience. You could only find it through um, running tests and seeing what happens in reality, what what one can learn from your everyday experience. And then you have another school who uh, believes that no, truths can only be found through rationalism, that experience is by its very nature uh, faulty, that you, in some ways, excuse me, you can't trust it, right? And we've all had that in our lives, in our own experience, where, um, you know, there's something about your reality that you know is untrue, and, uh, and I would add that at bottom, where they find a conception of truth is in a notion of God. And this becomes another question that is uh, operating between the two schools, because the empiricists in suggesting that truth lies because of the scientific revolution that was going on at that time in the individual's perception, it suggests things about God, and this was a challenge to social mores of the time. Definitely. And we got to remember that, especially the first few episodes that we're going to do, we're dealing about old white guys, old European white guys from the 1700s. Uh, God is not something you can just dismiss. And philosophy is always running up against this problem where it's, it's always on the verge of you know saying God isn't real. And of course, we'll get there later on. Uh, spoiler alert for those of you keeping track at home. Um, I think we should just do really quickly, just say a few words about the Enlightenment because the period of time that Kant's writing is following the Renaissance. It precedes uh, modernism. And what it's primarily known for, you know, are, are scientists, right? So you're, you're thinking of Darwin, you're thinking of um, Isaac Newton, um, where, the European world is going through vast technological change and extreme gains in scientific knowledge. And Kant is sitting in Konigsberg, Prussia, where he lived his whole life and never left. Uh, is Took the same walk every day. <laughs> <laughs> every day. Uh, is kind of lo- almost looking with some uh, envy, shall we say. And he's, he's wanting to do the same for philosophy that's what what is happening to science, that what Isaac Newton is doing in England to science. Uh, and he's looking to create a, a foundation for philosophy. Um, you know, we've been talking about uh, uh, rationalism versus empiricism. Already you can tell there's kind of an issue with, with schools, with dogma. And he's trying to break through that and create a foundation from which... Uh, all good philosophy can spring from. So he's looking to sort of separate the wheat from the chaff Mm -hmm. and build solid ground that we can all 
that we know any, everything we're talking about and discussing about in philosophy is something that is substantiated by the truth. Yes, and he was in a particularly interesting geographic area, being from Prussia, where, as you said, looking in jealousy, there wasn't a lively philosophical debate surrounding him no. directly. No. What he was dealing with was relatively virtual. It was abstract. It was something coming through text. And while he had his own circle, he, um, he was able to build something, this structure, this opposition to two dogmas and to take them in essentially by himself. And, and that's one of the more uh, astounding aspects of this book. Totally. And like when we say Konigsberg, Prussia, I mean, people kind of associate Prussia with Germany, which isn't incorrect. But Konigsberg, which is like basically like Kingstown, I think it translates yes. to directly. Um, right now, it's part of Russia. And it's like in this weird part of Europe that's like sort of sandwiched in between uh, Denmark and uh, a lot of the like kind of Eastern Bloc countries of Europe. Um, and so he is kind of like very uh, isolated in that sense. And I mean, I think this is actually a great part to start getting into the, the book itself. Um, he sets out, he's actually uh, in his epigram, he's like, blah, 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 to his excellency, which is Frederick the Great, which is kind of the first Prussian German leader um, who is sort of making a nation state of that part of the world, um, but is also well known because he embraced the Enlightenment, where a lot of other kings and leaders of countries were very suspect of it, as we were saying with relation to God and whatnot. Um, and one thing that I really like uh, in another writing of Kant's, he wrote this thing uh, called What is the Enlightenment? It was, a, it was like a five-page essay that he probably published in a newspaper or something. Um, but he has this quote in, in Latin, Caesar non est supra grammaticos, which I'm sure I just butchered, but it's a dead language, so who cares? <laughs> uh, basically, the emperor is not above the grammarians. And I think that's a great way not only to sum up what the Enlightenment was, uh, but also to what Kant is about to do. He's trying to create a grammar for philosophy. Absolutely. Um, and it, it is a somewhat political statement in insofar as it does not subordinate any individual to another individual. And this is something that bears out in the philosophical text. Um, so would you like to jump right into... Let's deep dive. All right, let's, let's do it. Let's deep dive. Yeah. Um, so Kant begins this, this book, this huge undertaking, um, kind of laying out a few dichotomies. Um, so, you know, we've already talked about empiricism versus rationalism, but the first thing on his checklist is, uh, these concepts called a priori and a posteriori, which don't directly relate to empiricism and rationalism, but, uh, the way that I kind of like to think about it, and you can see them in the in the root of the words, a priori, prior, prior to experience. So these are things um, that are innate to us. And there are a posteriori um, things that we understand about our world. You know, post is right in there, right? Uh, post experience, things we learn from our everyday lives and, and the lives we live. And I would say that there is a degree to which it is, uh, you know, distant from this debate, but the a posteriori, it, to some degree, has a representative relationship with his main interlocutor early in the book, which is David Hume. Absolutely. So David Hume is the the finality of the empirical movement. He took it to its logical extreme, and he essentially created a theory of habit, of... Uh, our experience being a, a relationship of A to B uh, and A to B again, that we can only know insofar as we experience it, which brings up the question, what if, you know, famously, what if the sun doesn't rise tomorrow, that we cannot know that that cannot happen, and um, or that that can happen, and um, Kant has a direct problem with that. And, and you shall see that the a priori 
takes uh, precedent over the a posteriori in his uh, analysis and in in his uh, his uh, architectonics, his his development of structure of this book. Absolutely, um, absolutely, and like you know, a great way to think about it is so you know. Kant's reading these translations of Hume and and actually being very excited by him. He's not, um, you know, trying to set out to disprove Hume, but I think one of the things that he was very interested in is that um, Hume eventually found up, wound up coming to this idea that um, cause and effect, which is something that's huge in, uh, say, the sciences of the Enlightenment, you know, you 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 hit a cue ball and it hits billiard balls and you can geometrically sort of predetermine where things are going to go. Uh, Hume decides that this is impossible a priori. That that before experience you cannot think, uh, you cannot understand that a cause has an effect. And Kant is like, well, wait, 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 wait. Everything in the Enlightenment is kind of centered around math. You know, especially like if you think of Isaac Newton and uh, his studies in gravity and light and everything. And the thing about math that's interesting to Kant is that it's all a priori. It is without experience. Somewhere in the book, he says, uh, you imagine three lines uh, put together and they are already a triangle before you know what a triangle is. And and in a sense, it's almost as if because Hume is also extremely influenced by the developments in mathematics and sciences, but it's almost as if they are opposing, and this is a degree to which there is an opposition, the physical sciences where you have this uh, practice of hypothesis and experimentation and mathematics where you are working with an abstract system that uh, produces results without any reference to an external object. Right. And so wouldn't you say this? Kant is finding himself in this point where he's almost sympathetic to Hume. Yes. But he sees the importance of a priori, of judgments, of things that are sort of um, not encumbered by experience. Because... You know, one of the important things about Kant, and maybe you'll disagree with me, but is that he was kind of the first to recognize the infallibility or the fallibility, excuse me, of the subjective experience. Experience, all experience is subjective. You know, um, what you were, you and I can see the same thing, right? A crime can happen and they can interview that we can be interviewed later as to far as what happened. We can tell drastically different stories. Well, I would say he is the first to philosophically account for that. Where, as even in Descartes, you have this question of illusion, and this is something we were actually talking about prior to the show. We do exist in real life. Believe it or not. Subjectively, <laughs> that may not be true. <laughs> but, nonetheless, um, Descartes says that, you know, the world may be illusory. We may see a a person off in the distance and believe they're a person and they are actually some type of mechanical contraption. Right, because Descartes is like, what if this is all in my head? Yes. But in the end, he comes to a trust in God to guide him through to to truth. That That when we see these repeatable truths then we have to look towards what is the possible cause of them. And, and he finds an infinite cause in God. By the time we re reach Hume, there's no, he doesn't have the same desire to locate a cause in God, a, a first cause. And so Kant has this problem of, well, if we do away with the first cause of God, then how do we understand illusion? Because for, for him... Hume's justification doesn't entirely make sense, right? right because totally. there is repeatability. There is consistency in what in the things that we see, in the things that we talk about, etc. Right. So illusion and non-illusion are two things that he almost puts together in, in the same realm. And, and I think that's bared out philosophically. So Kant, in trying to deal with this, he, he creates another dichotomy, right? Um, that he calls analytic and synthetic. And these are, uh, for those of you who are more familiar with 
these philo- philosophical texts will recognize as lo- logical terms. Um, and so analytic and synthetic do not have uh, parallels to rationalism and imperialism, but rather uh, analytic, which is elucid- elucidatory, um, it, it doesn't add to anything. It's basically a judgment or a statement where uh, the concept basically you you're able to understand a concept that you already have through something else right so uh, all unmarried men are bachelors is the like famous example yes. of that um, and then synthetic which is something where two concepts are sort of combined to create another concept yes and you can have both a priori and a posteriori analytic and synthetic concepts so he's already sort of mushing up this distinction and yes. making it less clear. And and if we were, are to return to the dogmas, and I, I think maybe this might be the end of, of, you know, strictly referencing empiricism and rationalism, except for specific thoughts, if you imagine the two dogmas, on the one hand, the analytic uh, a priori is the rationalist position that we can rationally uh, reason all the way down to a first cause, but everything else innately we can think through. And for the empiricists, the synthetic a posteriori, that we are constantly, uh, through experience, taking in, synthesizing new concepts and expanding our thought... um, are the two points, two vec- two points on a matrix, and and he adds the other two to show that there is content in all of them, and that once we understand this this content and functioning of all of the four, that we will have a better understanding of what reality is and what the grounds for reality are, and how to separate falsehoods from truths, very yes. specifically. Um, you know, so Misha, I'm kind of wondering, like. What would you say, why is Kant so fixated? Because Kant is, and right out of the gate, very fixated on the concept of a priori knowledge. And wh- what, what is it, its importance to Kant? I, I believe, you know, one is the direct answer to empiricism, which is that there has to be some way in which all of the experiences of all people have some type of consistent relationship that allows them to uh, communicate, to uh, experience, to think. Uh, and in addition to that, uh, I believe that he, he, in his mind, saw that there are these basic tenets, these basic functions in these ideas that are precipitating them, that, that determine them. And he had to give a name for that. Right. Like when you have a question like cause and effect, the function of cause and effect, the A to B, right? He immediately saw a basic structure aesthetically. Um, or when someone talks about the sun rising up and down, he saw an aesthetic structure externally. And, and I think those reasons are, lead exactly to what it is that he finds to be grounding in experience. Right. Absolutely. Um, and I should say, when we say aesthetic, we don't mean my beautiful aesthetics, <laughs> uh, but more or less the the description of. Right. Yes. In the German, it means kind of more this, or he's using it that way, not like beauty per se as aesthetics. Um, and also, I think too, there's th- what Kant is really grasping towards is the necessity, right? And so, as we've kind of mentioned, he's recognizing the fallibility of subjectivity that. Uh, I can experience the sun rising every day, um, but just because it does every day of my life doesn't mean that it will forever rise. It doesn't mean, I think we were talking about this before, where it's like, you know, if I smash an egg with a rock every day, and that's my breakfast, and I come across a, like, lead egg, uh, you know, there is the chance that it will not break. My experience isn't determining that this is always going to be the case. And so what he's trying to focus on is like, what is determining? 
Yes. And with a priori, what he's trying to recognize is the fact that we are all, as subjective people, objectively interacting with the world in the same way. Yes. But to as an as an aside or as another side from that that objective quality is filtered necessarily through the subjective and therefore if that is so then what in the subjective is objective or what is repeatable it it isn't simply as the rationalist empiricist felt a relationship to our objective relationship is to the object itself it is instead that our objective relationship is to ourselves and i think this is kind of the turn that you were referring to earlier that is um so important in this book. Yes. Um, yeah. And so he actually mentions it a bunch in Critique of Pure Reason. Like one of the like defining parts of the Enlightenment, or a lot of people would consider this part of the Renaissance, but some would argue it's the beginning of the Enlightenment, is Copernicus famously figures out that in fact the universe does not revolve around the earth like people had thought up until the late 1500s when he's figuring this out, but that in fact that we're all revolving around the sun. And in in the book, in fact, Kant is referencing this, that this is what he wants to do for philosophy. He wants to change our perspective in the sense that um, matter, reality, is actually conjoining itself to our subjective experience, yes, not the other way around. Because philosophy up until this point is that there is an objective reality and our uh, experience corresponds to that. And Kant is saying, no, 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 no. Objective reality conforms to our subjective experiences. Yes. And, and he does this through a uh, deductive process. He he see he he goes back to Descartes' meditations, and I think he derives a a natural deductive pr- process. Another reason why it's called very legalistic. Yeah. But um, and he tries to find what is it that is at base of our uh, conscious experience, and the two th- the first thing that he finds he finds two things is that we have sense right that we have. The and here we talk about aesthetic that we have a, a sensory experience, almost a field of experience that comes experien- experientially from outside, and that it is infinite. That it anything can and can possibly appear. So possibility is another um, extremely important word in understanding his a priori uh, aesthetic terms. Um, And then he finds a second one in that we experience these senses, the way that we can demarcate them, the way that we can say that a thing is an object or that it is represented as an object is through time, that we have this internal sense by which we process the these external senses. And so these two pr- provide the a priori uh, uh, transcendental conditions for our, our experience. And so by transcendental, he means, as we were talking about, absolute, total, um, conjoining, uh, and... and you know, almost imagine a field, a geometric or a geometric uh, um, matrix. Uh, yeah, with Kant, it's like something so big that it transcends us, you know, and that's kind of the weird way he's using that term. And and for Kant, he's locating, okay, so before any experience, when we're born, when we're babies, when we're like two years old, you know, and d- we're not socialized yet, we're not you know, we're like basically blank slates. What are the things that we all share that we're, that we still are experiencing the world through? And he identifies these as space and time. And just in that alone, it seems like obvious or like, you know, like, uh, (laughs) but, uh, that's how babies sound. Yeah. yeah, I mean, uh, that's how I sounded when I was a baby, but, what he's what he's identifying and what is important about his identification of these things is that all of us 
you know, no matter how old or young or wh whomever we are, we're all experiencing the world through an outer sense of space. You know, we can all see and understand space before we have, uh, you know, a, a social education. You know, we're not, we don't, we never have to be taught what space is. And then he argues, maybe a little less convincingly, but that we also have an inner sense of time. You know, and not like the ticking of our watch time, but that uh, we are experiencing the arrangement of things in space in moments which make up our time. Uh, and so he's identifying like, well, okay, here is a place to start. You know, at least all of us humans experience the world through space and time. But that experience precedes our actual experience. Yes. It's actually the filter through which experience is created from. And in in this he gives a name, and that is that it is intuitive, right? Yes. That yes. we intuit these senses and that they are that the a priori aspect is that it is something that is immediate to us. So we have sense, we have time, and then this allows for him to question what type of structure then do thoughts, does understanding, does reason uh, arrange itself, uh, uh, accrue um, upon these basic grounds? Right. And, and this is like, and this is kind of the, the beauty and boringness of Kant <laughs> is that he is like, he's really concerned about this stuff where it's like, okay, if we want to talk about understanding, which is like, right, what philosophy is, is some kind of uh, manufactured understanding. He's looking at the processes that create understanding. And so for him, first we intuit the world. It comes to us through the senses in space and time, right? So even if you're, um, you know, born blind or deaf, there's still an understanding of both space and time. And this is, this is for him, the, the like sort of equal ground, the starting point in which you can build a philosophy from. Yes. Right. And it, it creates a relationship by creating the internal and the external. You have the subject and the object or for him, what he describes as these this coalescing of the senses as phenomenon, and and this becomes an important word less used than is often ascribed to him because he often uses the word object as well. But normally, when he is referring to an object, he is referring to the phenomenon, which is the representation that is the object for us. And this will be something that we're going to play with this whole fucking series. This whole series, <laughs> uh, because this is also something that gets handed down to us through translation. Because uh, you've got uh, uh, you, Max I, Mueller, right? Me, is your yeah, translation. translation. I have a Werner S. Pluhar, this giant, a, a better translation. Brick uh, off um, the top. And, and, but the only reason I mention it is phenomena is never used in this book, or at yeah. least up until the point we're going to take you today. Um, which, of course, is just an added complication to everything we're going to talk about because nine times out of ten, what we're going to be reading is not in English, and we're both obviously English-speaking people. Um, but I, I agree with you, actually, even though this is the more like literal, abject translation. Really what he's talking about is phenomena, and we're going to see this later on in phenomenology. Um, all of these things have their their trails that you can, you can take. Um, so so after this he he starts to question then what it is that we can build upon this basic structure and um he starts to question what would a transcendental logic look like and be and before he starts with uh the transcendental logic he talks about the logic that we have currently right right, right which he calls a general logic and a general logic for him is one that is uh, surprisingly similar to what he calls a priori categories. But um, it, there are some minor differences. Um, 
it, for him, a general logic is one which has no empirical content, and therefore all it can do is be analytic, right? So uh, you can look at a scientific system and you can break it down however you want, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. but it, this will not produce any actual knowledge, right? And when it does, he or at says least not any any knowledge that's not merely taxonomic yeah. or like scientific, yes. right? Like. But it doesn't produce meaning. Right. right. That's probably a better way, right. way to put it. Definitely. He, he says, uh, general logic is either pure or applied, and the former no account is taken of any empirical conditions. And so the applied form is what will eventually become uh, the transcendental. Um, but uh, also, um, not every kind of knowledge a priori should be called transcendental i.e. occupied with the possibility of the use of knowledge a priori, but that only by which we know that and how certain representations, intuitional and conceptual, conceptual can be used or are possible a priori only. So to break yeah, that down. Yeah, let's break that down because that's what the whole book sounds like. Yeah. And I know you're, you're already rolling your eyes like five seconds into it. So yes. let's break that down a little bit. So, so very quickly. Um, what, what he is trying to say here is that if we are to have a logic, a, a logical understanding of objects, that is one that does provide meaning, that we must have, it must have a quality of, of experience. Now that experience does, or yes, of experience, but that experience does not have to be an individual singular experience it just has to be a priori experience and this leads to what he means by a transcendental logic which is that he believes that there are logically in our judgments and in what he will call categories um basic fu uh, functional tables that determine exactly how we relate in the terms of judgments between propositions and in the term of categories, how we relate concepts. And a major part of this is how we combine, divide, um, how we uh, synthesize, as we used the word before, um, uh, how we relate multiples and turn them into something that is usable, something that is uh, communicable, something that is true. Right. Right, because he's, again, he's not interested in, you know, how fast a body falls through air. He's interested in metaphysics. He's interested in meta across physics, physical world, you know, what is beyond. He's interested in, in questions like God, like freedom, free will. Um, and so what he's trying to identify is a solid base, something that's shared, and trying to create a transcendental logic, a logic that can lead us beyond what is already apparent, right? Um, in a way that can, that can give us, you know, the, the kind of shrouded truths, the questions of metaphysics, right? Do you have free will, for instance? Is there a God? What is the spirit? Um, and so he's trying to find a way, how do we use logic? How do we use the experiences we have before we experience anything to identify more hidden truths. You know, if you're a, a you know, like a, a, an atomist, somebody who's studying, um, you know, nuclear physics or something, you're trying to get to those, you know, hidden truths hidden in the, in, in the base, in the origin. And that's yeah. kind of Kant's uh, plan, if you will, I guess. But what, what is very interesting to his style and to what we uh, demonstrated earlier in, in the way that he tries to synthesize two schools to find an answer, um, here in his examination of logic, he says that, on the one hand, a general logic can only be analytic, but when it presents itself as being something originary and as creating meaning, that is dialectical. And mm -hmm. by dialectical, he doesn't mean what dialectic would uh, c become over yeah, time. Yeah, sort of mean which to is, us today, right? Yes, but he means the uh, sophistical tendency to oppose 
one's uh, proposition with another negative proposition purely rhetorically, which which is to say I, I say one thing and you just say the opposite to contradict me in argument. Right. Kant, would, Kant goes on to say that this is a paint the ancients used to, uh, you know, basically patch over illusion. And he's trying to get away from that. He wants a transcendental dialectic. Yes, and and that's what's fascinating about it because he said because he finds a way to even use this object that he sees historically as problematic, right, as a more uh, disjunctive, uh, which is a word that he uses for judgments, uh, means of uh, understanding ideas that he could potentially use the dialectical opposition. Um, of of things to um, the dialectical opposition of things to better understand ideas in general. Totally, um, totally. And I mean, you. I don't know if you would agree with this. Maybe I'm talking out of my butt, but you know, in a way, his approach is almost dialectic in the kind of way we understand it, where he's like trying to use what seem like opposing terms, empirical and rational, and synthesizing them into what they actually are, you know, that, that, that we're almost seeing what appears to be an antinomy that is not. Um, and, uh, actually maybe that's a great way to move on because, uh, with analytic, uh, sort of logical judgments and, and categories, he has the synthetic, which as it sounds is a synthesis of ideas, something that produces something new. Yes. And, and the synthesis is also, this grounding immediate process, the, the the primary first process that he sees the mind going through. Now, we have somewhat glossed over his his tables of categories and yes. judgments. <laughs> These are um, just uh, s- simple relationships that he he marks out in triads um, that he sees as both uh, a pri- primary, a, an opposite, and then almost a uh, synthesis of the two that make it so that every judgment or uh, concept can relate in mul- multiple ways, in, a, a, in an individual way, in an opposite way, and in a multiple way. But um, as he gets to a transcendental logic, he changes direction. Um, he instead wants to see how categories can apply to our understanding, to our reason, to uh, the way that we Im- imagine and determine the world. And he sees this as starting through the synthesis of sense. And what he calls that is uh, the imagination. Um, and uh, would you like to describe the imagination? Sure. Though? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so he, he describes, uh, the imagination as, uh, the power of presenting an object in, in intuition, even without the objects being present. So basically what we're trying to talk about as far as synthesis is that, um, actually I'll bring it back a little bit. He, basically he's like the way we experience the, the conditions of possibility for experience happen a priori. So he's setting up the fact that all of our experience are set up by systems that happen before we ever experience anything. And the way that he sees that is that um, we take in a manifold of sensations. So the time that I'm living in and also the space of this room, uh, the way that, you know, the sort of more descriptive elements of all the objects in the room I am taking in through my senses uh, and that manifold of experience is being sort of made into a synopsis uh, through our senses. And so, you know, my intuition in Kant's words, when I come into a room, I see the room. And if there are people in the room, I see that there are people in the room. If there is a drum kit in the room, I see that there is a drum kit in the room. Yes. And, uh, and, and just as, uh, as an aside... He calls this a faculty, yes. and 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 yes. faculties are applied. So he calls the use of our imagina- imagination apprehension, right? right? And but, this but, is apprehending, right? Objects. But he would say that I I do not walk into a room and know that it is a room and that there are people in the room and a drum kit, 
But actually, everything I'm taking in through my senses is synthesized through imagination. So imagination is actually, it's one of the things where Kant starts to get, I, I think, exciting to me because, you know, um, he, he associates it as a, a capacity or power of the soul, which is a direct quote. Um, and that is what the imagination is. It is this thing that he, he prescribes innate to our soul, whatever that means. He doesn't ever define what yeah. a soul is, granted. Um, but something existing in us, in, in humanity, that is able to take sensory inputs and create them into a, a synthesis of the manifold of experience that we're experiencing at every second. Yes, and, and, and even if we substitute soul for subject, which is something that he, he, will, he will use more regularly, it is to say that we all have this capacity to take what is given and produce something that is more than what is given, right? But it, it isn't as simple as that. Right, it isn't right. as simple as we can imagine and then we create out of our minds that which is, exists. Instead, he then er, brings up another two faculties, right? Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. First, he brings up a concept called apperception, right? So apperception is the idea that even a, a priori, even before we experience, there is an innate I am, almost a statement of I am in our being, in our uh, thinking of a thing, right? Right, that so like, I am in this room, right? Yeah. Not just there is a room with people, but I am in a room with a Tom, with a person, right? Absolutely. And um, he says, for instance... Synthesis is an act of spontaneity, determining, and not, like the senses, determinable only, and therefore able to determine a priori the senses, so far as their form is concerned. According to the unity of apperception, the faculty of imagination is, so far, a faculty determining our sensibility a priori, so that the synthesis of the intuitions, according to the categories, uh, must be transcendental synthesis of the faculty of imagination. So again, a complex statement, but it isn't so complex when you understand these terms, that he is saying that once we have this basic inherent function that we are, right, it isn't even a thought, and that we can imagine, that we can take in this sense and do something with it, we have a transcendental grounds for the production of concepts, of ideas, of thoughts. Um, right, and he would he would call that the transcendental unity of apperception, um, which he calls the the transcendental unity of apperception is the unity whereby everything manifold. So all of the different versions of stimuli we're taking in as a body with senses. Uh, everything manifold given in an intuition is united in a concept of the object. So um, basically a very long-winded way of saying the processes by which I recognize a shape in space and time and can call it something. Um, I, I, I'm just going to – this is a quote from uh, – from Critique of Pure Reason, but basically to sum it up, basically he sees that a priori, uh, we have an a priori synopsis of the manifold through sense, so our senses take in a manifold of all our stimulus and, and you know, separate color from sound and uh, all these things, and is synthesized through imagination. And the unity of this synthesis, synthesis through original apperception. So basically, we have senses and we have an imagination to kind of uh, organize those senses. And our apperception is what unifies these things into a room with people and a tom, a, a drum, right? This is a, a perfect description of it. But even with that, he sees a problem. 
again. And, yeah. he, and, and this is one of the great features of Kantian philosophy and Kant's method. Um, and the problem is that even if we had all of that, which we do, how exactly would we relate the tom to the amp that I see over there to our guitars that are behind us and uh, come up with the concept of playing music, for instance. Well, it would require a way of causally relating object A to object B to object C and then in our imagination producing a new synthesis of that. Well, in that, he... He describes something called reproduction, and reproduction is essentially memory. Totally. It is his way of saying that we are able to reproduce internally through the function of time as an a priori uh, grounds and condition of thought um, that which has already happened to us. So just as the imagination has this projective power forward, the uh, re reproduction has this uh, internal power to, re to take the past and reproduce it in the present. And with only with this would we be able to connect all of these moments that we m m uh, mentioned earlier, all these phenomena into a single consistent experience. And, and he describes this as a line. And, and repeatedly, he uses this figure of a line, like an arrow, as the manner of time, but also as the manner in which we connect all of the senses and experiences logically. Yeah, something that is a, a whole, but also parsable. Yes. You know, and actually to, to go upon your... Because he loves talking about lines, but that's probably because he loves <laughs> geometry. Yes. Um, but we see this stuff even uh, expressed in modern science, right? So um, they found out, like, when I think of swinging a baseball bat, that very subtly all of the muscles that I use to swing a baseball bat fire. Not in a way that makes me swing, but the way in which my mind thinks about that involves all the parts of the body that is involved. And, and Kant actually seized upon this idea in his writings from uh, Critique of Pure Reason. I love this description of, of synthesis because I, th I think it maybe takes uh, jargon-filled language and makes it a little more understandable. He says, and this is in the second version on page 138, he goes, uh, in order to cognize something or the other, for example, a line in space, I must draw it. And hence, I must bring about synthetically a determinate combination of the given manifold. So, uh, it, you know, in order for me to think of a line, even if it's a line I am seeing and didn't draw, in my brain, that line must be drawn. And that's how I make it a line rather than just, uh, you know, an unidentifiable part of the manifold that is given to me. Yes. You know. Um, which is just crazy if you think about it. You know, that, that 300 years ago, he's already identifying that, like, in identifying anything in my world, I'm actually creating it. Yes. It, it, is, it is kind of baffling. Um, one one uh, problem that has come up in contemporary um, philosophy of the mind, and, and this is another thing that we have talked about before, but it is the color problem. And this is something that he speaks to in a famous quote about cinnabar. He says, if cinnabar was red sometimes and then uh, another color another time, that we would not be able to really understand anything. And this is the reason for these faculties. And in a, in a famous debate between Max Bloch and W.V.O. Quine, um, Block challenges Quine's theory of how language can signify things at all. And he says this by explaining that if my green were your red, how would we know that? And we can expand on that. If the words that we described the red as warm, if, if my hot was your cold and we had the same reactions to them, but inverted, how would we know? And for Kant, it's irrelevant because yeah. he is not talking about 
the content of experience. He's rather talking about this pure undergirding structure of experience and how that creates consistency. We could be experiencing anything subjectively, but by these faculties, um, and soon we will get to the third, which is uh, understanding or recognition, um, we are able to create a unity under apperception, under the I am, that allows us to be able to be a whole subject. Yeah. And, you know, it's funny because what you're reminding me of, and kind of a great way to explain what Kant is doing for philosophy at this point, is like those memes that were going around like not so long ago yes. with like the dress. Is it white or is it blue or gold or whatever colors it was? Um, you know, it's fun to argue about that. Like, oh, I, oh, and now I see it the other way. Um, but the point is, is as fun as those arguments were, we were always seeing a the same image. Yes. But B, we all understood what it was. Yes. And we were just arguing over semantics. And what Kant is trying to do is being like, enough of this. This isn't getting us anywhere. This is actually miring us down and preventing us from from flirting with what understanding could be or is, right? Um, you know, it's like the ancient Greeks didn't have a word for blue, but it didn't make the sea or the sky any less you know, what awe-inspiring. It, yeah, right? what it was. Right. And and so in 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 his third faculty, which is the understanding in which from the beginning is always demarcated as the profound end of the faculties. How do we understand? He which he references in in multiple different ways, he comes to the conclusion that it is the creation of rules, the faculty of rules, um, which he then says, and as well, laws. And he defines this in two different ways, that rules are that something can be some way at uh, all the time, or that something, a law is, that something is some way all the time. Uh, And, uh, you know, this is all to lead to how can we use the concepts that we speak about, right? The concepts that uh, we use philosophically and make them as transcendental as all of these other things that he's, he's uh, spoken about. How is, how is it that mathematics is able to create its constructions conceptually? And this is, again, through this threefold process uh, overheaded by our being right right of intuition imagination and apperception or apprehension reproduction and recognition as they are applied absolutely absolutely uh but of course this is going to lead us to our next episode which is uh going to come up soon is that you know kant is trying to develop this almost rule of law for philosophy but in it he he's admitting his own holes you know he's because he's very concerned about other philosophers picking his theories apart and proving him a charlatan or something and so he's like very keyed in on this and and so um he's very concerned with things like this and admits you know he says um because we create ourselves in the i think you know that we determine an i he says we cannot know ourselves before this point In this, I cannot determine existence as it presupposes I, and I create my thought and intellect through these processes, while what I am remains mysterious. And so he's admitting to us here that these are the ways that we take in the world and and not only interact with, but make sense of, and all find an objective reality that we can all point to things and share, uh, but is it also admitting that he has, still has a lot of work to do because even with all that, it is impossible for any of us to ever know who we actually are, which, as far as a metaphysician is concerned, is a pretty big deal. Yes. <laughs> you know, like, um, and he talks about this too in, in, in other objects, that we can perceive them as what they appear to us, but not as things in themselves. 
the, and, and there's two sides to this coin because he brings up this massive question and then he makes this massive conclusion, right? So simultaneously as we become a phenomenon for ourselves, he reveals that it is not that reality is this thing that we conform to, but necessarily that reality conforms to us because the only thing that can fall into appearance is the phenomena, is sense, is our memory, is the, the, the concepts that we use. Um, and he says it in, in this translation, um, however strange, therefore, it may appear at first, it must nevertheless have become clear by this time that the affinity of phenomena and with it their association and through that, lastly, their reproduction, also according to laws, that is the whole of our experience, becomes possible only by means of that transcendental function of imagination without which no concepts of objects could ever come together in one experience. It is the permanent and unchanging ego or pure apperception, which forms the correlative of all our representations. If we are to become conscious of them, and all consciousness belongs quite as, as much to such an all-embracing pure apperception, all, all, as all sensuous intuitions belong as representations to a pure internal intuition, namely time, the apperception it is which must be added to pure imagination in order to render its function intellectual. For by itself, the synthesis of imagination, though carried out a priori, is always sensuous and only connects the manifold as it appears in intuition. For instance, and he goes back to it, the shape of a triangle. So <laughs> He loves those triangles. <laughs> so while that was long, it draws out in, in, in entirety, this structure, which is all mutually reciprocal and without which we could not have any other part, without which we could not have any concepts, and uh, without which we could not have any reality at all. So the individual, that when we think of a subject, we think of an individual subject, but the subject as a whole forms this transcendental condition, these transcendental categories, these transcendental a priori functions and faculties that necessarily then create a problem mm -hmm. that we are always mediated by them. And that this isn't a word that he would use, but that uh, we, we cannot experience them ourselves. Right, by the way we process the world isolates us from ourselves, which is uh, a hell of an existential problem to have, um, but one we do have. And, um, you know, I think it's also amazing, too, because not that he was trying to do this, but in an era in which you have Darwin and these kinds of scientific um, attempts at physiology and things like this, uh, which lead to imperialism and racism and, and all of these um, kind of specters that haunt us today. Kant is actually giving us the, the objective reality that we all have, that we're all coming to this world as I am, and sort of almost giving us this, this pathway to uh, not only transcend these kind of like social ills, um, but that the only pathway to discover what the soul is or what I am or you are or what you mean to me or I mean to you comes from our objective shared traits that we uh, digest the world through. Yes, that, that we, we cannot tear ourselves apart from, that we are sutured to. Yes. And... and in that it creates a a mutual ground, a a consistent ground for all to stand upon. And while that subjectivity in his own text and in future texts um, comes to question that, it is a profound notion that 
each human being and we could question animals or, you know, an AI or something of that sort can form a subject. And that subject has, because of its subjectivity, a, um, a profound value. Yeah, and a profound meaning and, uh, you know, an I am, which is, at least in our society, the fundamental value that we have. Absolutely. So um, I, I think that pretty much concludes the first, uh, our first episode. Um, we're going to be back on the Kant trolley next week or next episode, I should say. Yeah, yeah. It um, should, be, should, should be a month or, or so, but... Right. But um, thanks for listening. Hopefully uh, you're digging it. Um, please, if you have questions, follow up with us. We'd be happy to uh, talk to you and try and answer any questions you have. Um, uh, we want to thank RCM Studios. This is where we're recording. Um, in beautiful Chicago, Illinois. And, Go Bulls! And also the boys behind the cameras, Jake and Matt who without this, it would be impossible. It would look very bad. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you so much. Uh, be yeah. well. Cheers. I-, I love you all. I love you too. Baby, baby, baby.